We all like to watch things. Some people like to watch movies or go to the theater. They watch sports or Netflix and YouTube. Odds are if you're watching this video, you understand exactly what I mean. But what happens when watching becomes less of a hobby or an activity done for leisure and more of an obsession? What would you do if you found out that you were the subject of someone else's watching habits? This horrifying thought became a reality for a family in New England. Derek and Maria Bratis were in the market to buy a new home in mid-2014. They finally decided on a six-bedroom, four-bath house in Westfield Town, New Jersey. They bought it for $1.3 million, and they were related since it was the same town Maria had been raised in. In fact, it was only a few blocks away from her childhood home. It wasn't far from schools, it had more than enough room for them and their three children. Everything seemed perfect. Once the closing was complete, they quickly started some renovations and began to move all their possessions in. However, the Broaddus family would never actually move into the home. It was three days after they had closed and Derek had just spent the evening painting and doing some light repairs when they went outside to check the mail. The usual mail was there, a couple of advertisements, a few bills, and a card-shaped white envelope. The envelope was filled out in thick, bad handwriting and had been addressed to the new owner. He opened it and began to read, Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. As Derek continued to read the letter, however, the warmth it began with would quickly take an odd turn. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched this house in the 1920s, my father watched it in the 1960s, and now it is my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies in the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. At first, Derek thought it might be a joke or someone trying to scare him, but the letter also included some details about the Broadduses that proved the author, whoever they were, had already started observing them. There were details about the family's vehicle and how they had hired contractors to do some of the heavier renovation tasks. I see that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it's supposed to be. Tisk tisk tisk. Bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. Earlier in the week, the Broadduses brought their children, 5, 8, and 10 at the time, to see the house, meet some of the neighbors, and the children quickly became friends with some of the neighborhood kids. You have children. I have seen them. So far, I think there are three that I have counted. Are there more on the way? Do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for your growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Derek was understandably beginning to be angered at the letter and quickly re-examined the envelope to look for any clue to who may have sent it. But there was no return address. Derek again went to reading the letter. Who am I? The person wrote. There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out of any of the many windows of 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. Welcome, my friends. Welcome. Let the party begin. Signed, The Watcher. As soon as Derek finished the letter, he quickly went inside, turned off all the lights so nobody could see inside, and called the police. The Westfield Town Police dispatched a unit to the home, and once the officer had arrived, Derek explained the situation and handed the letter over for the officer to read. What the f*** is this, the officer said. He then went through all the common questions you might ask someone who was experiencing something like this. Like if Derek or the family had any enemies or any recent altercations with anyone. Of course, Derek hadn't and there were no easy answers. The officer recommended that Derek just stay alert, call again if any new details surfaced or if he saw any suspicious people around the property. As he was leaving, he also recommended that Derek take a heavy piece of construction equipment inside the home from the front porch so that the watcher wouldn't try to use it to smash a window. Derek locked up 657 Boulevard and then returned to his Briar home where Maria and his children were. After telling Maria about the incident, he then decided to send an email to the former owners of the home, John and Andrea Woods. They had lived there for 23 years before selling the home to the Broadduses, and it seemed logical that if what the letter was claiming was true, that surely the Woodses would know something. 
The next morning, Andrea Woods responded stating that her and her husband had indeed received an odd letter in the mail shortly before moving out, that it was from the watcher, and that it also made reference to the watcher's family having been obsessed with the property for generations. They claimed they just threw the letter away and never gave it much thought. Andrea then agreed to go with Maria down to the police station where they would both give a statement and meet a Detective Leonard Lugo. Detective Lugo told Maria not to mention the letter to anyone else as any of her new neighbors were now considered suspects. The next few weeks for the Broadduses were very stressful. Derek ended up canceling a business trip and on the few occasions that they went to the new home, Maria would keep a very vigilant watch over the children, yelling at them if they had ventured too deep into even the corners of the property. They were invited by neighbors across the street to attend a barbecue, and they agreed despite being on high alert. Again, they would constantly yell at their children to stay close. Maria would later say she felt like people were bound to think she was overbearing and crazy for how closely she was watching over her children. Once the renovations were complete, Derek offered to give a tour to another couple who lived nearby, but was immediately creeped out when the wife said, It'll be nice to have some young blood in the neighborhood. A common expression, but still enough to send Derek into a panic. After that, Derek had the opportunity to speak with a neighbor who lived two houses down, John Schmidt, about the neighborhood, and during the course of the conversation took the opportunity to pry a bit about the other neighbors. John would tell Derek about the Langfords, who owned the house between them. He told Derek how Peggy Langford, who was in her 90s, had several of her children living in a home with her and that all of the children were in their 60s. He described the Langfords as odd but harmless. He then told Derek about Michael Langford, who was one of the youngest in the house and how he didn't work, he had a long beard like Ernest Hemingway, and described him as a Boo Radley type of character. Boo Radley is a character in To Kill a Mockingbird, and his defining characteristics are that he's reclusive and only comes out at night. Derek was now very suspicious of the Langfords, and that suspicion would only grow as time went on. Meanwhile, seemingly small things kept happening around the property. Things like a heavy sign that had been hammered into the yard by one of the contractors being ripped out during one of the nights. To Derek, anything and everything could be a potential sign of the Watcher's presence. Two weeks after the initial letter arrived, Maria was at the new home checking some paint samples and decided to check the mail. In the mailbox was another card-shaped envelope filled out with thick, bad handwriting. Welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The workers have been busy, and I have been watching you unload cartfuls of personal belongings. The dumpster is a nice touch. Have they found what's in the walls yet? In time they will. In this letter, however, the watcher attempted to address Derek and Maria directly, but misspelled their last name, indicating that on at least one occasion, the watcher had been close enough to the property to overhear someone saying their names. The watcher boasted about having learned so much in the recent weeks about the family. The letter identified the Broadus as three kids by birth order and by their nicknames, the same nicknames that Maria had been yelling when the children had ventured too far away from her. I'm pleased to know your names now, and the names of the young blood you have brought to me, it said. You certainly say their names often. It went on to reference an easel that had been stored inside an enclosed porch and inquire about one of the children directly. Is she the artist in the family? 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood play in the basement? Or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Will they sleep in the attic? Or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher and have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, my obsession. And now, you are too, Broadus family. Welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard, and now it has brought you to me. Have a happy moving in day. You know I'll be watching. After the second letter, Derek and Maria stopped bringing their children to the home entirely. Derek was now almost positive that it was one of the Langfords, as their house had the clearest view of the enclosed porch that had the easel mentioned in the second letter. He installed various webcams throughout the property, 
started to make maps and tracking who had lived in the neighborhood the longest and when they had moved in. He also went so far as to draw a circle around his house on his map, indicating which areas were within earshot. Needless to say, this was starting to bother him more than a little, and he was becoming obsessed. Derek went on to share his suspicion with Detective Lugo, and Detective Lugo told him that he was already aware of that possibility, and that he had brought Michael Langford in for questioning about a week after the first letter had arrived. Michael denied knowing anything about the incident, but Lugo would share that Michael's narrative of the situation had matched things mentioned in the letter. Without hard evidence, however, the police couldn't really intervene and arrest Michael, or any other suspect for that matter, and this infuriated Derek. Later in an interview, Derek would be quoted as saying, This is someone who has threatened my kids. The police are saying, Probably nothing's gonna happen. Probably isn't good enough for me. This person attacked my family, and where I'm from, if you do that, you get your ass beat. Derek told the police after the second letter had arrived that if they didn't intervene, they were going to have an entirely different case on their hands, implying that he was on the verge of handling the situation himself. Derek's obsession with his own investigation began to drive a wedge in between him and Maria, and he would later confess that Maria was starting to think that he was going crazy. Since the police were of little use to Derek and his family, they turned to other professionals. They hired a private investigator who would frequently stake out the home and watch for the watcher, and who ran background checks on the Langfords, but these measures didn't turn up any information. Derek even reached out to a former FBI agent who was the inspiration for Clary Starling in the hit film Silence of the Lambs, and another former FBI agent, Robert Linehan, who was hired to conduct a threat assessment. Linehan would identify various traits in the Watcher's prose that would give them further hints as to who authored the letters. From the way the letters were addressed, certain traits in the language used throughout, the double spacing between sentences, and other things, Linehan surmised that the author was older and a voracious reader. In his threat assessment, he also concluded that although the tone of the letters was ominous, it didn't indicate much of any real threat, and the author was unlikely to act. The only thing that concerned Lenahan was the number of errors and typos in the letters, which indicated a certain level of erraticism. There also seems to be an underlying disdain for the wealthy in a few sentences. He pointed to this passage in one of the letters as particularly telling. The house is crying from all of the pain it is going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. You're stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be in the time when I roamed its halls. The 1960s were a good time for 657 Boulevard, when I ran from room to room, imagining the life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then it got old, and so did my father. But he kept watching until the day he died. And now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. The Broaddus is in cooperation with the local police, in an effort to bait the Langfords, sent a letter to them indicating that they had plans to tear down the house. Nothing happened. The situation was all-consuming and both Derek and Maria would mention that it was even infiltrating their dreams. Derek dreamt of confronting the Langfords, and Maria dreamt about a man who was hunting her children down and calling to them with a pitchfork in his hand. Slowly but surely, they both became suspicious of anyone and everyone scanning the faces of people at shopping centers and spending hours trying to Google anyone who even seemed slightly suspicious to them. By the end of 2014, all of the efforts to get to the bottom of this had stalled. The watcher had left no fingerprints, no digital trail, no evidence at all, and the police indicated to Derek and Maria that they had exhausted all the available options. Derek installed a brand new security system, and even looked into getting a professionally trained guard dog for the family, but despite all these efforts, the Broadduses were still unwilling to risk what may happen if they officially moved into the property. Eventually, they had to sell their old home and move into Maria's mother's home, while they were still paying the mortgage and property taxes on 657 Boulevard. After six months of going back and forth to care for the property, they decided the best course of action was to just sell the house and be done with it. But by then, the rumors had already started to spread, and potential buyers knew there wasn't something quite right about the property. They had to disclose to the bank what was going on, and indicated that they were willing to fully disclose the letters and information regarding the investigations to any serious buyers. Eventually, they even brought up legal action against the Woodses for not disclosing their letter to them. This, however, would prove to be a mistake, as the case would eventually be dismissed and it would open the floodgates of attention. They received over 300 media requests for interviews. One reporter even went so far as to set up a lawn chair right in front of the property and conduct his own watch. 
Eventually, the Broadduses fled Westfield entirely and moved into a friend's beach house. The case would go on to become an internet sensation, with various internet sleuths trying to get to the bottom of it only to come up empty-handed. Furthermore, evidence would surface that would exonerate the Langfords and they would no longer be considered suspects. A DNA analysis conducted on one of the envelopes showed that it was from a woman, and various handwriting analysis came up with no matches. A renowned forensic linguist even scoured all the local forums and internet posts for overlap in language patterns and couldn't find a match. Now there were even rumors that the Broadduses had hoaxed the entire event due to buyer's remorse, or that they were trying to lay the foundation for an eventual insurance fraud attempt. After unsuccessfully trying to sell the property, the Broadduses became vengeful and even sought permission to tear down the property, but the requests were denied by local government. After being unable to sell the house, the Broadduses turned to trying to rent it out, and they struck a deal with a family that had grown children and two large dogs. In an interview with Star Ledger, the renter mentioned that he wasn't at all worried about the watcher, and that his lease had a clause which allowed him to break it if another letter arrived. Two weeks after that interview, and two and a half years after the first letter, another one came. Violent winds and bitter cold, to the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife Maria. You wonder who the watcher is? Turn around, idiots. Maybe you even spoke to me, one of the so-called neighbors who has no idea who the watcher could be. Or maybe you do know, and you're too scared to tell anyone. Good move. This letter was less stylish and more wrathful than the others, and it seemed the writer had been closely following the story. I watched as he watched from the dark house in an attempt to find me. Telescopes and binoculars are wonderful inventions. 657 Boulevard survived your attempted assault and stood strong with its army of supporters barricading its gates. My soldiers of the boulevard followed my orders to a T. They carried out their mission and saved the soul of 657 Boulevard with my orders. All hail the Watcher. The letter went on to indicate that revenge may be coming. Maybe a car accident. Maybe a fire. Maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away but makes you feel sick day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet. A loved ones suddenly die. Planes and cars and bicycles crash. Bones break. Despite the ominous tone of the new letter, the renter decided to stay anyways. Eventually, the Broadduses would finally rid themselves of the house when an anonymous buyer agreed to buy the home in 2019, five years after our story started. The house sold for 959000 a far cry from the $1.3 they had spent to buy it, and the additional 150000 they invested in its renovations. Derek would have his revenge, however, when on Christmas Eve, an anonymous letter would be hand-delivered to the number of houses containing people who were critical of the Broadduses. These letters accused the families of speculating inaccurately about the Broadduses. It included several stories about recent acts of domestic terrorism in which signs of brewing mental illness had gone unnoticed. These letters were signed, Friends of the Broaddus Family. It was eventually revealed that Derek himself had written these letters. Thus concludes our story of the Broadduses and their run-in with the Westfield Watcher. Ultimately, no arrests were made, and whoever they are, they're still out there. Perhaps stalking 657 Boulevard to this day. Who do you think the Watcher was? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching this first episode, and be sure to like and subscribe so you can be among the first to dive into all the coming installments. See you soon.